Hello everyone, and welcome today to our discussion on professional ethics. Today we're going to talk about ethics with respect to how they differ from an ethical behavior and why that is important to us as both auditors and as professionals. We're going to talk about what kind of a framework can we use when we get into the situation where an ethical dilemma will exist, and inevitably throughout one's career this will happen. We want to explain the importance of ethical conduct for the accounting profession. It's very important that we be both ethical in fact and appearance, and we'll talk about what the difference between those two are and why we should care about them as accountants or as auditors. And then we'll talk about the AICPA's Code of Professional Conduct and what kind of guidance that gives us with respect to conducting ourselves ethically. When we talk about ethics, we're really talking about a set of broadly defined moral principles or values. That is, what do we think is important to us? So, and we can see that ethics differ within cultures and society. So what's ethical in one society may be deemed unethical in another society. And we see the dilemma that this causes us as we speak to globalization and um, uh, our boundaries for business practices expanding worldwide. And so it becomes important again for us to recognize what are our ethical boundaries, what are our values, those things that guide our day-to-day decision-making and actions. And then when we get into situations where we have conflicts again with those, the, this idea of ethical dilemma, we have to have some way of resolving it in a way that meets our professional guidelines and standards and something that we can um, rest comfortably with personally. We're giving a model here to think of ethics and um, ethical values. This model is derived from the Josephine Institute of Ethics, which is a nonprofit membership association for the improvement of the ethical quality of society. And what they've done is to provide six core ethical values. Uh, and if we start and just talk to each one of those for a couple of seconds, when we look at trustworthiness, we're talking about honesty, integrity, reliability, and loyalty. And these are aimed at um, establishing good faith intent, that a person acts according to conscience regardless of the situation, that we make all reasonable efforts to fulfill our commitments, and that we are responsible to promote and protect the interests of certain people and organizations. When we talk about responsibility, we mean that an accountant is accountable for their own actions and in exercising restraint. So that is, we take ownership of the decisions we make and we don't seek to rationalize or place blame. When we talk about caring, we really mean genuinely being genuinely concerned for the welfare of others and including, um, which includes altruistic and showing benevolence. So we have compassion. When we talk about citizenship, we really are talking about obeying laws and performing one's fair share of work to make our society or our organization to work when we talk about fairness, we include issues there of equality, impartiality, openness, and due process. Fair treatment means that similar situations are handled consistently. When we talk about items like re with respect, we're talking about notions such as civility, courtesy, decency, and dignity, autonomy, tolerance, and acceptance. So we want to treat people the way we would want to be treated. And these values, these core values help us in getting through our day-to-day -day actions, and we really want to keep them in mind in our dealings with others, in our dealings with our clients, and in our ideas of this desired state of being that we want to have met at the end of the day, or even at the end of our career. And so we don't want to underestimate the importance of ethics. They're necessary for society to function in an orderly manner. And I think that without much imagination, we could um, envision where we would be as a society if there were widespread unethical behavior. In a lot of cases, we could say that the um, we could look at it as a microcosm when we talk about Enron or microcom, micro MCI. 
um, where there were these um, uh, this core group of people who were responsible for establishing an overall ethical culture who failed. And then we look at the widespread losses by both the shareholders, the investors, and the employees. So the need for ethics in society is sufficiently important that many commonly held ethical values are incorporated into law because we see cases like this where um, these leaders uh, did not execute their responsibility to maintaining an ethical culture and environment that has damaged in the end many many other stakeholders. We can also see without much of a stretch that uh, individuals' ethics may differ from those of society as a whole. Uh, these are the people who take the shortcuts, who act selfishly, who are out for their own interests and or their own self-interest without regard to uh, the interests of those that they work with or those that they serve. Um, it's unfortunate we have those types of people that we have to deal with, but they are everywhere, and we and. In our response to those situations, we want to be careful not to become one of those people and to always hold ethics up in high regard and to have high ethics illustrated in the actions that we take, the way we deal with people, our output and product, our work ethic, um, all of the things that go into making us a professional. And this is a rather simplified um, example of it, but if we find person A finds a briefcase containing important papers and $1,000, um, unethical behavior, selfish behavior, would be along the lines of tossing the briefcase and keeping the money, brags to his friends about his good fortune. Um, hopefully that these actions would differ from most of the rest of the people that we come into contact with. However, in some cultures, these types of actions are not far removed from uh, what might be the norm. So we want to keep in mind that um, ethics are relative. They're not absolute and they are um, we need to establish the values, the core values that we just talked about that what are important to us and then it, when we have situations similar to this come up to act within those core values. If we look at person B who faces the same situation but responds differently. He keeps the money but leaves the briefcase. He tells nobody and spends the money. He has violated his own ethical standards and chose to act selfishly. So there's really not much difference between what person A did and what person B did. They took a different course of actions but in the end they were very selfish actions. And um, so again we point to this issue about well what are our core values when it comes to professional behavior, when it comes to quality work, when it comes to looking out for the interests of our clients and other stakeholders, and um, coming to some decision about, well, what is the right course of action for us to take when we're faced with an ethical dilemma or we're in, put in a position to where acting selfishly may benefit us at, individually and personally, but at the expense of other stakeholders. So please keep that in mind. I can't stress that enough as a professional and as someone who's seen all over many, many years, seen these actions come to fruition that in the end, uh, rarely does the selfish act prevail. And so here we talk about uh, that an ethical dilemma is a situation in which a person faces a decision that must be made about appropriate behavior. And there are a lot of pressures on us as auditors and as accountants and as professionals day in and day out, um, assignment and assignment. And so we want to make sure that we um, are uh, position ourselves and equip ourselves with a strong set of core values so that in hindsight someone can't look at a decision we made and maybe it's a wrong decision, maybe sometimes it doesn't show good judgment, maybe it shows a lack of experience or maybe a lack of knowledge about something, but the decision doesn't show or reflect um, an act made solely out of selfish interest to better ourselves, again at the expense of uh, our clients or third-party stakeholders. 
There's also this um, trend or um, need to rationalize unethical behavior once it's happened. And we see these types of um, uh, excuses coming up. Everybody does it. Um, that's the way it was handled last time. Or I know somebody who was in the same situation and that's what they did. But again, that doesn't make it right. And um, I would ask each of us to consider under that situation, is that a decision we want to live with? And do we want to reflect on that later on and um, be proud of that decision? Others may say that if it's legal, it's ethical. And that's not true at all. Uh, very few laws are written without some that don't require some sort of guidance or judgment or interpretation by the citizen. And so simply because the law says we can do it doesn't mean that it's ethical. And then we also look at the trade-off between the likelihood of discovery and the consequences of that. And um, it's um, inadequate to make a decision because we think we'll get away with it or because we think no one will notice because if we don't, or if they do, we're in that situation where we then have to um, be held accountable for that. And again, on reflection, is that what we want and how we want people to think of us and to judge us? And so when we're resolving these ethical dilemmas, there are a couple steps that we can take to think through what our, you know, what our decision could be. One is we obtain the relevant facts. So what's important here? We want to identify the ethical issues from the facts so that we can decide, well, is this a matter of something being right or wrong? Um, or is it a different issue that deals with my responsibility toward another person? We want to determine who's affected. Is this just simply me or is it my client? If it's neither, is it someone who may be relying on my work output? We want to identify the alternatives available to the person who must resolve the dilemma. So what are our, what are our alternatives? What, how could we address this? Sometimes we react in, without stopping to consider all the possible choices we have and what our next step is. And then think through the likely consequence of each alternative. And then after we've gone through all of those steps, decide on the appropriate action. And in deciding on that appropriate action, this is where the idea of our core values come in because then we are in a position to where we um, can be held accountable for the decision we make. So these are all important steps if we, when we get to a point that we have an ethical dilemma and these become very important because they can and sometimes as we've seen can make or break a career. So I encourage you to stop when that happens. Stop and think about these uh, decision points and make an informed decision that you'll be proud of later on. When we talk about relevant facts, and this is a good example, um, a staff person has been informed that he will work hours without recording them as hours worked. So that's fact one. Fact two is the firm policy prohibits this practice. That's fact two. So fact three is that another staff person has stated that this is a common practice in the firm. So we have this dilemma. We have been informed that we will work hours without recording them. We know this is against the firm's practice, but we know others do it. So this is a good example of an ethical dilemma and how we would respond to this. And the case study associated with this week's session on ethics is directly related to this, and it will give us a, um, some good practice at dealing with these types of real-world dilemmas that come up in the professional career of auditors, accountants, any professional. So as we go through this, we understand this dilemma. We understand that it's ethical for the staff person. The question is, is it ethical for the staff person who worked hours and not recorded them as hours worked in this situation? So then we take our next step to say, who is affected? How are they affected? And what alternative does the staff person have? And then we choose from what those alternatives are in accordance with our core values. And again, you'll come up to practice putting in place some of these um, uh, steps to resolving ethical dilemmas when you start working on the case study. So here we talk about the special need for ethical conducts in profession. So when we talk about a professional, we're talking about people who are expected to conduct themselves at a higher level than most other members of society. Along with this expectation becomes a the um, an additional expectation that ethical conduct will be followed. 
and that we won't succumb to the pressures that may come along with making decisions or with the pressures that come along with holding responsible positions and having others ask us advice and uh, to be in a position where we direct the actions of others. So CPA firms are is exactly this. We CPA firms provide um, financial opinions among other services uh, to financial statements. These financial statements are relied on by others to make economic or for economic decision making purposes. Um, we have a responsibility to the users of these financial statements to issue an opinion. It may doesn't have to be a, a good opinion um, in that it's um, uh, unqualified. It could be a qualified opinion or we have may issue a disclaimer or an adverse opinion. However, all each of those opinions is after we have gone through the audit steps that we talk about during this course and um, gathered evidence, evaluated that evidence in accordance with standard and applied our judgment to that to come up to some level of opinion about the financial statements. And the users of these financial statements expect and demand that those opinions are developed in an ethical way that looks out for those users' best interests, not the best interests of the client. The client is responsible for issuing the financial statements and not the best interest of the auditors who whose engagement the following year may be it may hinge on the, the decision to use an unqualified or the decision to issue a qualified or an adverse or a disclaimer. However, we can't let those pressures influence us in which of those decisions we need we issue. And that is what professional ethics is all about. And so this slide summarizes the most important ways in which CPAs can conduct themselves appropriately and perform high quality audit and related services. And we can see that some of these items include um, obligations to stay current in our Field, such as continuing education requirements. We can see that they are, that the profession itself has established a way of examining professionals and ensuring that they have the level of competency through the CPA examination. We can see through peer review that it's a self-policing profession and that peer review requires the audit work papers of competitor firms to be reviewed in a safe way that um, uh, so to ensure that across the industry, CPA firms are meeting their documentation, evidence gathering, and review requirements. We can see that as a profession, we've adopted a code of professional conduct. And we can see that um, the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, or the AICPA, has established practice sessions that are aimed at dealing with the contemporary changing dynamic environment which in with we which we operate and um, coming up with ways of keeping the profession um, uh, current and uh, responsive to the needs of the public. And so on this slide we see the AICPA code of professional conduct. And what this does is to provide both general standards of ideal conduct and specific enforceable rules of conduct. There are four parts to the code. Principles, which are the ideal standards of ethical conduct. There are rules of conduct, which are minimum standards of ethical conduct stated in specific rules which are enforceable. There are these interpretations of the rules of conduct which are interpretations, obviously, of the rules of conduct by the AICPA Division of Professional Ethics. And then there are ethical rulings, which are published explanations and answers to questions about the rules of conduct. So that th this is meant to, these ethical rulings are meant to provide guidance and um, um, to help the professional CPA interpret and get to the right decision. When we talk about responsibilities, we talk that professionals should exercise sensitive and moral judgments in all their activities. When we talk about the public interest, we talk that members should accept the obligation to act in a way that will serve and honor the public. 
because essentially our audit opinion is helping the investing public make certain economic decisions. So we have a responsibility that these audit opinions are um, made in the best interest of this investing public. When we talk about integrity, we're talking about um, this idea of of making the right decision according to their conscience regardless of the situation. This objectivity and independence is very important and the AICPA goes to a great deal of, of trouble to provide guidance so that um, the objectivity and independence of auditors is not questioned because that really when the investing public starts to think that the um, CPA is no longer objective and they're not um, independent in how they evaluate the evidence they gathered it really clouds the usefulness to the public of their their audit opinion. Do care really relates to this issue of um, uh, providing going through the steps, right? Providing a level of service and then um, making a decision that comes about as the consequences of that level of service. And then scope and nature of service means adhering to um, the rules around what it is that CPA firms are allowed to provide as services. For instance, we can provide a certain level of services to public firms if we are their auditor but not other services because we are their auditor and we can this rule doesn't necessarily apply to non-public firms even if we are their auditor so it's and this figure just gives us a visualization of the um, difference between the um, our practices with respect to the rules of conduct and um, those that are we provide or we are get we get guidance on as a result of principles. When when we are when we act in a way that is beneath the rules of conduct, then um, we really are providing uh, substandard services to our clients, and these substandard services not only will damage us in the long run, they will damage the uh, users of financial statements, the external stakeholders, and the profession um, at large. And so here we talk about this idea of independence. Um, the AICPA and the International Ethics Standard Board of Accountants identifies that um, ethics requires auditors to be independent, and that is independent of mi in mind and independence in appearance. When we talk about independence of mind, we're talking about the auditor's state of mind that permits the audit to be performed with an unbiased attitude. If we recall early on, we talk about the auditor's role and the phases of the audit, and part of those are to gather evidence and to um, review that evidence and to evaluate in an unbiased way um, that the treatment of that evidence and whether it's in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. And this is that independence of mind where that unbiased way becomes important. And then we talk about independence and appearance. And so that's how does the um, investing public perceive our independence? Um, if auditors are independent in fact, but users believe them to be advocates for the client, that is to be biased toward the client, then most of the value of the audit function is lost. So it's important that both independence of mind and independence in appearance be perceived and be um, guiding the conduct of the audit. The Sarbanes-Oxley Act and the, the SEC provisions are also provide a lot of guidance and concrete regulations aimed at um, maintaining this independence. And of course these were as a result of abuses of the independence and the um, coziness that some of the accounting firms got with some of the um, organizations that committed fraud and so um, an outcome of that was to strengthen regulations and statutory laws surrounding the conduct of the audit and what becomes necessary uh, on behalf of accounting firms uh, in uh, maintaining this independence. 
and then these were supplemented with more rules related to uh, the uh, performance of certain tax services that the PCAOB or the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board issued in addition to the Sarbanes-Oxley Act and SEC provisions. And he, here we get a good example of the prohibited services. So these are services that the auditor cannot provide if they act in an audit capacity. So they are not able to provide actuarial services. They are not able to um, be a source for internal audit outsourcing. They are not able to offer accounting or other bookkeeping services. So you can see it's a fairly strong list and what it really is aimed at doing is maintaining this independence in mind and this independence in appearance. So by pro prohibiting the offering of these services, the thought is that the audit, the quality of the audit, and any conflicts with independence uh, will be, um, won't happen. Then we also have, for publicly traded companies, this idea of an audit committee. And these are members of the board, usually three to five independent directors, um, who, are, who are tasked with engaging the auditors, establishing the scope, understanding the consequences of the auditor, and making sure that the auditors stay independent. So the audit committee has a, a responsibility to the shareholders as well. And as we said, all members must be independent, and at least one audit committee member must be a financial expert. There are other um, guidance and rules that, require, that are required of CPA firms for publicly traded companies, and that is that a one-year cooling-off period must occur before a member of the audit engagement team can accept a key management position at a client. And so what that means is that if you have a partner in charge or um, a senior manager who's working on an audit and they're offered a key management role at a client during the period of the audit, they're not able to accept that for one year beyond the date of that offer. Um, and that's intended to preclude the appearance that someone may be getting a job at a company who, which suddenly creates an interest in that person and a relationship between that person and that company that didn't exist previously that might um, uh, sway judgment or opinion by that auditor. And so by having this one year cooling off period, it's meant to um, uh, negate to a large extent that from happening. And we also have this requirement by Sarbanes-Oxley that requires the lead and concurring audit partner to rotate off the audit engagement after a period of five years. So if you have a part, a, an audit partner who's overseeing the audit and who's uh, reviewing the audit work papers, uh, reviewing the work of junior auditors, um, interfacing with the client on audit issues, uh, these senior audit team members are required by Sarbanes-Oxley to rotate off of the job every five years for a period of five years, and then they can rotate back on. But again, this is intended to um, maintain this appearance of independence uh, to uh, ensure that there's this independence of mind as well, so that um, if as these relationships don't um, cloud or result in misguided um, efforts. Then we have um, ownership interests are also uh, addressed in these rules and regulations, and these are by the Securities Exchange Commission, um, and they we've gotten certain rules that are developed that say um, auditors, members of audit committees, uh, members of the families of the audit team are restricted from participating on the audit if they have certain financial interest in the companies that are being audited. And then we address these other issues in our rules and regulations that are covered in the text and they really talk to shopping for accounting principles. So what accounting principle or treatment gives a the best outcome for the organization and how do we as auditors uh, manage that. 
uh, we talk about the engagement and payment of audit fees by management and the problems that that issue, those issues come up with, with respect to, again, independence. And um, then can the auditor be truly independent if management, if payment depends on company management? And obviously the issue is no, since the financial statements are the responsibility of company management. And if through the payment of fees, that responsibility can be shirked, sure, then we obviously have ethical issues. So we also have certain rules that the profession through the AICPA have developed that again are aimed at maintaining the integrity of the audit and the auditor. Rule 101 prohibits certain members from owning any stock or other direct investment in audit clients because it is potentially damaging to actual audit independence, um, and that is independence of mind and certainly independence in appearance. And it is these um also deal with indirect investments such as ownership of stock in a client's company by an auditor's re relative, presuming that this is these investments are material to the audit. And so we can see that there are a lot there's a lot of guidance out there to help us avoid these uh, ethical dilemmas. We just have to know that they're out there. We have to access them and take advantage of all of the information around them that we have to help us get to some conclusion that doesn't hurt or reverse the intent of what a good audit does.